Uh, welcome to my talk. I'll be talking about a better way to do VPF in PowerShell 5 Plus. This morning I realized that the 5 Plus didn't really make sense, at least one week ago, when there was no announcement of PowerShell version 7 with .NET Core 3.0. But now in the new version there will also be VPF in PowerShell Core, or it should be, so now it can be 5 Plus again, not just 5. So in this session, I will try to show you how to write a reactive application in VPF without naming all your components and explicitly updating all of the state. The agenda, I will go through the traditional approach to VPF, then I will explain what MVVM is and uh, show, it, show you how to use it in VPF. I will show you an example in C Sharp, the same example in PowerShell, because in C-sharp it's much easier to understand for you what's happening. And then I will show you my tiny framework that implements the same thing. And then I will try to explain how it all works. It's not, not very difficult. I really try to explore the idea to see what's happening, if it's possible to do it, and um, just try to keep it as, as much PowerShell as I can. Okay, so a traditional approach to VPF in PowerShell would be to name all your components, look up the component by name in code behind, add click handlers to buttons, and then just set and update the data explicitly by assigning them to the variable. So let me find a demo. Is that okay in the back? Okay, awesome. So traditionally what you would do is that you would have an application, you import the presentation framework. Uh, I have something that you probably don't see uh, that much, but I call it a model just to make it similar to the other example that I will be showing. And this one holds the data that I will be using. And then I have this super simple application which just has a window grid and a label inside of it, and the label is named text. So this is important because that enables me to look up the label by the name, I can identify it, I can get a reference to that component, and then I can modify it from my code. Also notice that you don't have to include all of the namespaces that you normally see in, in VPF unless you need them. Then I'm just parsing the XAML, and um, if you do this, make sure that you are typing this to a string because otherwise it will give you weird errors because something with XML. So this is important. And then I'm just looking up the component, I'm setting the text and then I'm just showing the whole window. So what happens is this, it just starts an application and says, hi, PSCon for you. So super easy, super easy demo. You probably already did something like that if you did any VPF in PowerShell. The traditional approach has some upsides and some downsides. So the upside is that it's very explicit. It does exactly what you want. It's pretty easy to grasp if you have any experience with uh, WinForms or if you just uh, start with VPF, there is very little to learn. You just grab the component, modify it, it does what you want. It's easy to do in PowerShell and, as I said, similar to WinForms. The downside is that you have to name everything, you have to look it up, you have to update the data, and also doing reactive stuff, stuff like I have a path and I have a button, and if the path is empty, I want the button to be disabled. That's difficult because then you have to check it, you have to register event handlers, you have to do actions on them, and so on. And even if you call this action from multiple places, like a menu and a button, you have to do it for both places and never forget to update it correctly. It's also not how VPF is meant to use. So a new approach would be the MVVM approach. So MVVM stands for Model View View Model, and I will explain it in detail later. I just want to show you the first demo uh, or first I want to show you a quick, very quick demo very similar to the other one. So this is how you would do it with MVVM. 
notice that the difference here is that instead of having a name for the label and then set the content from the outside, I'm saying I have content, I have some binding, some connection somewhere, and it will be connected to text. And the text is the property on the view model that I have defined above on line four. And then I do pretty much the same thing. So I parse the XAML, save it in window, and then I'm doing something that you probably didn't see, and that's assigning a data context. And so a data context tells the window where it should look for the properties that I'm binding to. So the text will look at the current data context, try to find the text property on there, and it will propagate it into the content. And then I show the window. So this is what happens, that's totally the same thing, but instead of grabbing the object, reaching into the view, and updating it, what I'm saying is here's a view, here's a model, push it on the view, and the view will automatically pick up the data. Does it make sense? Is anybody confused? Because this is super fundamental. Okay, great. Now, the upsides here are, this is the way WPF is meant to use. The MVVM pattern was probably invented to, for it. If you do it correctly, the data will update automatically as you update them on the, on the model, and that's great because then you just have to think about the code, about the simple object that has the properties, assign stuff to it instead of going back to the view and making sure that both of those sites are the same. And also, if you do it correctly, you can disable actions super easily because what you have are commands, and you just say, this command can run only if this condition passes, and then every place where you bind the command will be able to disable the component by itself. And it's also testable, because the object has just properties on it and maybe some methods, and you can just plug them into tests, and instead of fiddling with, I want to look up this component, and then suddenly you have a lot of code and tons of components, you just test the view model if it does what it does, you tell it, I'm calling this command, should it do, should do this action, and so on. The downside is that it's probably impossible to do properly in PowerShell, and I believe that for a long time, and that's also why I tried to investigate it. But it turned out it's quite easy, so let me show you a demo of what I implemented in PowerShell. It's quite stupid, but quite nice. So I have this Pokemon browser. And so I have an app, and I can click refresh, and it invokes a command on an object that's inside. There is some wait time because it re goes to internet, plus there is like 500 milliseconds of sleep to make it show more. And you can see that down in the bottom I have this progress bar that I'm simply enabling by saying, okay, this should be visible, this shouldn't be visible on the model. Then I grab this list of all Pokemons from the Poke API, and I can go for like Pikachu maybe. And I decided not to make it reactive, so I could also make it like when I select it in the list, it will automatically go here. But uh, instead, I want to have this another button that will reach again to the internet, grab all the data, and push it back. And then I just say, OK, on this object that I got in the response, I want to grab weight, hate, the picture into the image, and the name of the Pokemon. And that's it. So it just, er, the data arrive, they update on the property, and they're automatically shown in the UI. I don't have to tell it from the code at all. Who's, who's, your, who's your favorite Pokemon? Who knows Pokemons? Just say some name. Bulbasaur. Bulbasaur, okay. Yeah, that one I like as well. So that's how it works. Just grab it from the internet and so on. So let's look how it works and what is used to do it. Okay, also there is a piece of Pokemon trivia, so I shown you, uh, showed you Pikachu. And so pretty much if you have Pichu, so there is this idea of evolvement of the Pokemon. So if you feed the Pichu with enough friendship and you're really good to it, it might evolve into Pikachu. But do you know what happens when you feed Pikachu with a lot of PowerShell awesomeness, boost and Panzerwagens? You get Yapchu. <laughs> Yay! 
Yeah, it's easily attracted by PowerShell conferences and meetups. And you could also spot it yesterday around the bar. And if you have whiskey, then you can get him. <laughs> okay, now that will be difficult to go back to the series. <laughs> So let me tell you a bit about MVVM so you have the basic building blocks um, to see what's happening. So MVVM is model, view, view model. And the order in the name is kind of weird because it should be like view is here, view model is in the middle, and model is kind of in the back end. So what happens here is that the view is the XAML that you normally write. And then behind it, you have view model. And the view model is just some object that the XAML is using to get its data. And the way those two are connected is by bindings. Bindings are for data. So you can have one-way or two-way binding, or you can have one way from source, but let's just keep it with one way and two way. And that way you can communicate data in between the model and the view. So for example, you have a label as I had, and you want to push the text into the label. That would be binding from the view model to the label and it would synchronize for that. If you would have a text box, then you want to get some data into it from the model, but also if the user goes, clicks into the box and types something in, you want the data to propagate into the view model so you have them automatically there. And that's also super easy because that's the def default way the bindings work. So you just say binding to this property and you get all that. No looking up, no updating state, it just does it automatically on the object. And then there are commands. So commands are like your event handlers, but you don't have to register them explicitly, and they can do uh, different kinds of cool stuff. So pretty much if you have a button and you want to associate a click to it, you create a special property on the object, and then when you click, or you associate also the command, you specify it in the XAML, and then when you click, it will do the action. So this is very high level, and uh, probably doesn't use, this, doesn't use vocabulary that you would use in PowerShell. So in PowerShell, it would probably look more like this. You would have a XAML, then you would have some object that would help you uh, manage the application state. Like when I load the Pokemons from the internet, I save them in an array, and the array is on this view model. And to do that, I'm calling this PowerShell function that does all the work and just returns the data to me so I can say, save them in memory or store them in memory. All right, so the basic building blocks, binding, connects the view to property, as I said, works for top-level properties, but also for child properties. So you can say binding name, and it will grab the name from the object. You can say binding on the selected user, on his role, and then the name, and it will bind to this one. Or you can have a text box, and there are different syntaxes, and this is totally unnecessary. If you, if you would say just binding, path, binding name, it would work as well, but you can specify different properties of the binding if you want to restrict it this way. So you can do like path, name, mode will be only one way because for some reason you only want to be able to write the data into the text box but not update it from the model and so on. Once you get the hang of it, you will find some usages, I think. Updates in this, in this case are from the view are written directly to the bound property, but if you have a view model and you want to update the view, you need to raise an event. And this is the difficult part in PowerShell. But normally what you do is that you implement property changed on a C, when you do it in C sharp, that's what you do. You implement inotify property change interface, and then you have property change that raises uh, property change event arcs, and in the event arcs, you have the name of the property that changed, or if you don't have anything, it assumes that everything on the view model changed. And so if you want to uh, notify the view about the change, you raise this event and it will pick it up, and that's how it works. Then you have commands, so this is how commands work. They connect the view uh, to an action on the view model, and they are easily invoked from multiple places like menu, button, context, keyboard shortcut, that's one of their strengths. And they also can be protected by a guard. So you can give the command a predicate, something that takes data, or it's a script block that returns Boolean. 
And if the Boolean is true, it will enable the action, and if it's false, then it will disable the action. So this is how it would look like. You would have a button with a command, and then you would just say the binding is to refresh, and refresh would be a property on your view model. The view model uh, property should have type of I command, but it's typically implemented as this relay command class, which enables you to easily plug in actions. So what you could do is that you take the relay command object and you give it a script block that says, this is what you do when the command is invoked. And you give it another script block that says, every time you want to check um, if the action is enabled or disabled, just run this and you will see. And because this filter discard of the command is invoked often, then it should be pretty cheap to run. So don't implement anything difficult in it because it will slow down your GUI. And then async. So async, uh, because the way of how the UIs work, uh, we have like one thread where the UI is and where it's updated and so on, and then if you put heavy work on it, it will get stuck. So it will stop, stop responding to the user inquiries. If he goes by mouse on it, it will might turn blue or it just won't color the buttons. You cannot click anything and so on. So we need to have some way of doing async work that will run in the background and not block the main thread. And so heavy work like fetching Pokemons from web request should be in the background, not blocking the main thread because it would stop responding. And uh, there's also this idea of a dispatcher. So dispatcher is like a class that can uh, talk in between threads and you give it some work and it takes it and when the UI has time, it runs it on the UI. So you don't get into a problem where you try to write something into the UI and then you get exception that says, you are not, this thread is not owning this data, so you can only access it from a single thread. And if that happens, you know that you should have used dispatcher to invoke the action on the UI thread. So let me show how that, how that application that I've shown you before looks in C Sharp. It's super simple. I will just try to zoom this up as much as I can. That's probably too big. Can we do like 180? Maybe, maybe I can do with that. Can you read it in the back? Okay, awesome. So in the application, I have this view model base class that implements the properties so I don't have to repeat it on every view model that I have. And it's really super simple. I'm just saying uh, I will have an event that's called property changed that comes from this interface that's prescribed from the VPF so I can integrate with it. And then I have this equal delegate just to make sure that I will never run into null so I don't have to check for it later. And then when something changes, I just raise this property changed and create the property changed event arcs, give it the property name and so on. This is the, like, the easiest, less, least automated way to implement this, but it will look very similar in PowerShell as well. So in C Sharp, you probably wouldn't do it exactly like this. You would use some helpers and so on. But this is to make a point. And then on this main view model, I'm first creating the object, and in the constructor, I have refresh property in which I assign this relay command. And if you're not familiar with C Sharp syntax, then if you look at this and you ignore the async and await keywords, you should see a script block. So what happens here is that I would have a script block that would have no parameter, and um, I would call do refresh inside of it, and that's it. Nothing, nothing really difficult. And then this one would be just a script block that would always return true. So that's my guard that says this can run always. And then I have this show command, which is called when I click the button, when I already selected the Pokemon. And so here I again just call do show, and uh, it can be only pressed when the selected Pokemon is not null. So when I selected some, and then I create this HTTP client just so I can call the backend, the API that's public and accessible. 
Those are just some of my uh, in internal fields because the difficult part in C Sharp about, about notifications, uh, about um, VPF, if you do it without any plugins, is that you have to implement the properties like this. So you are raising the notifications when the value changes. So for example, when I change this Pokemon list and when I assign a new collection into it, I must let the UI know that it changed. And so what I do is that I first assign the value and then I raise the on property changed uh, event with the name of the property I'm updating. This enables me to notify it about this single property, but also it would enable me to notify it about multiple properties when I would want to say like, when the Pokemon list changes, then update that. But also I know that you will need to update that. So I will notify it as well. And then the same thing repeats for a bit. Everything is the same. Here you can see how the commands are shown. So those are just properties with type I command. So it can also integrate. So this one would be also prescribed to be used. <coughs> and then I do the actual implementation of grabbing the data. This is more difficult in C sharp than to do it in PowerShell because there you already have a commandlet. And so what's happening here is that I'm grabbing the data, um, reading the content, and then in the end, I will get the list of this Pokemon link view model. And this is what I see in the list. It, when I have the drop down box, there I have a name on the type, a URL where I can grab the details, and um, that's it. And so when I then select the Pokemon from the list where I'm only showing the name, I also have with this selected item associated the URL that I will grab when I do do show. And the progress. The progress is also quite interesting. This is, again, a very naive way to do it. I just have a try. And finally, and so on the top of the try, I set the progress visibility to visible. And then on the finally, I set it to hidden. So it doesn't move my UI, it's just not visible. Normally, I would do it with like Boolean flag maybe and a using and a converter. But I don't want to show it in this demo. But if you look at it later, then maybe, and you already know more about VPF, then maybe look those, look those terms up and try to implement it for yourself. And then in the do show, do again the same work. I just grab the URI and parse out the properties. And then I create this Pokemon view model, which lists all the stuff that I have in the detail and just assign the values. And then I assign it to the detail property on my view model. And because this will be notified, the UI will be notified and we'll see, okay, this view model changed. I have to re-render. I will pick up the data from the properties again, and it shows the new data, and that's it. You don't have to tell it, you just assign it to a new property and it figures it out. And that's the whole implementation of the app. So I don't have to manage the state, I don't have to do anything, I just grab the data and show them. Did I run it in here? Nope, same application, it does the same thing, rbook. So in summary, the view model class is implementing iNotify property change. The properties raise property change event when they are set. The commands use relay command to that refer to the this reference, like the current object. And we have task and async at our disposal in C sharp to implement the work that we want to offload into background. So in PowerShell, there are a few problems. First of all, PowerShell classes can't easily implement events. So that's a, that's a, that's a breaker. So what you do is that you just create a C-sharp class, and that can raise events, and then you just inherit from it in PowerShell. And you can easily compile that during uh, the runtime in PowerShell. So you just take the piece of code from C-sharp, you do add type, and now you have a C-sharp class that works. So that's one way around. 
But the other thing is that to be able to do those updates to raise the actual event, you need a setter. So um, in the classes, you cannot define custom setters. You cannot say, when I'm setting this value, it will do this and that. So my solution to this was to just create a script method that I will automatically generate from the code by this init method that I will call in my constructor of the class. And uh, what this does is that I tell it init this selected property on my class, and it will create this set selected and get selected. And the set selected will raise the event that will say to the UI, hey, selected changed, update your, update your data. And this way I make it work, make the binding work. And uh, it automatically updates. So overcoming this was quite difficult, but on the start of this conference, I was talking about this with Matthias, and he already gave me like three different ways to do this in a better way, so. <laughs> good, good to know. That's why you come to conference like this. Then we have commands. So they are super easy um, to implement as script blocks, because script block is like first class citizen in PowerShell, but the script block is missing the this reference that uh, gives you the current object that you are operating on. So my solution to this is just write the, write the relay command that I have in C Sharp, but instead of using the, this reference there, I'm taking an object and passing it in. And then when I call the script log that's provided, I pass the object inside as well. So if I wouldn't call it this, I would call it self. So I have like a self object referring to your PowerShell class, and then I have this uh, relay command, and I just give reference to this class, to the relay command, and everything works, everything is happy. And if you name your param $this, it will look very native, and it will look very much like the examples in C Sharp. Then background work. Background work is a problem because doing heavy work on the main thread is prohibited because it would kill your UI. So the, uh, the solution to that is to offload it to the background to like another run space. And there is a lot of work that already is done on this. So in my solution, I'm pretty much just using the thing that Boyd has done, and you can read all about it in here. But uh, I'm making it much better in the terms of integrating it with the rest so it looks very seamless. You don't have to manage your own run space or anything. You just give it the work and you just tell it, do this on the background, and it will do it on the background. And then you have this helper dispatcher function that enables you from the middle of your code to call back to the UI. So for example, if you want to say, I'm starting and the progress is zero, I'm here, the progress is 10, I'm here, the progress is 20. Then if you would do that directly by saying like dollar this progress equals 50, it would throw, it would throw an exception but if you do it through this dispatcher class, you just give it a script log that says dollar this progress equals 50, and it would call it in the right UI uh, thread, and everything works just fine. <laughs> um, yeah, the code is complex for the, for the background work, so I'm just hiding it away in helper methods. Uh, the methods on the view model base are in C sharp, so what I'm doing, I just expose a static property on the object and I set a script block into it, and then I just execute it in the background in the C sharp. So I can do most of the implementation in PowerShell, and um, it's very easy to understand. And one really bad problem is that classes need to be defined before use. So what you do is that you need to put them into a different file and then dot source it to the place where you're calling them from. So this is how it looks in PowerShell. How am I doing on time? Half an hour, nice. Minus, minus questions. Okay. Right, good. So if I open this, um, this is where I'm sourcing the tiny framework that I'm using. This is where I'm sourcing the tasks that I'm creating in the background. So those are the things that are connecting to the backend and grabbing the Pokemon list. Let's just look at them. So super easy, you just have URL, response, and then for each of the results, you return ps custom object. 
just so you enumerate it and you have custom objects for everything. And then if I grab the detail, then I just get the response and then I assign the things into this, into this object that looks like the data that I want to have in the detail. Then I have this view model which is like the class that I had in C Sharp, but in PowerShell. So this is how it looks like. I just inherit from the view model base that I introduced that, that has all the things that I want to do. It can raise the, uh, raise the events and so on. And then I just define the properties on it that I want to have in the UI, define the types that they should have. And then in the constructor, I'm using this dollar this init, which is a method on this view model base class, which inits the property in some way, in a way that then I would have a method on the object that would be called set name, and I can call it and use it to update the UI. In the main view model, it again looks very similar to the C sharp class. So again, I'm inheriting from view model base. I have this refresh property that has the type I command. I have the show property that has, again, type I command because they are both commands. Then I have this Pokemon list, which will contain the list of the Pokemons that I downloaded. This is the one that I selected, and this is the detail for the one that I selected that I populate when I click show. Then I have this progress visibility that enables me to show and hide the progress. And then this is a kind of a workaround. I will get to that soon. So again, I'm initializing all of my, all of my properties that I want to be able to update the UI. And this could be done, of course, automatically, but I want to have it here for visibility. And then I'm setting the progress bar visibility to hidden so it's not shown when the application is loaded because we are not doing any background work at the moment. And then I have implementation that actually grabs the data from the server and I'm using a script block to do it. And so I have this do refresh, give it a parameter. I'm naming this dollar this so I can refer back to it because that's the object that I will inject inside. So it gives me the same syntax as I have in C Sharp. And then I start and I do the same thing as I did in C Sharp. So I tell the dispatcher, go to the UI thread and update the progress visibility to visible so we can show that we are doing some background work. Then I uh, load this function, which is one of the not very clean parts, but I want to get it into the run space again because this is running on the background in a new run space, so I need to grab it and dot source it one more time. Then I call the function get Pokemon, which reaches to the server, gets me the data, and gets me a list like appropriate for my view. Then I sleep, so you can see it's actually happening. And then I update the Pokemon list to tell the UI, okay, the Pokemon list updated, so update yourself. But the UI will pick it up from my model and from the events. I'm never reaching the view, uh, view by itself and just grabbing the thing. I'm just saying, it updated on the view model, do your job. And then I set selected, and by default, I'm just selecting the first one that I get in the list. So I get something in, in that property as well. And then finally, I again, through the dispatcher, tell the UI, uh, the progress visibility should be now hidden because we are done with our work. Same thing with the do show, just with the minor detail that I'm grabbing the detail instead of the whole list, but I'm doing totally the same thing. I'm just setting the detail property instead of the list. And that's it. So then I just need to grab those two script blocks and assign them, assign them to the I command properties. And for that, I have another helper method that's on the main object where I'm doing all the magic with, uh, with the scheduling and the background uh, run spaces. But you use it just by calling this new background command or new command if you want to do it on the UI. Give it the script block that will do the work and give it a script block that will 
uh, check if the work can be run. So if, you are, if it's possible to run the work. Uh, you can probably notice that I'm missing here the guard that I had in the C-sharp example that said, if it's not selected, then disable the button. But it would be here, just dollar this uh, selected EQ or null or something. And uh, it would prevent the button from being pressed. Okay, makes sense. Questions so far? No? Okay. So, talking about command guards, or I should, I, yeah, I will show the command guards first and then the internals. That should be the one, I think. If it starts. Maybe not. It resets my IC. Okay, also a good result. One more try. Right, so this is probably pretty hard to see and I probably can't have any way to zoom it up. But if you go by colors, then this button is enabled and it can do stuff. And then the logic here is that when I press this, I'm just writing into property and just adding stars to the top. And I can only press this button if this uh, field has some value in it. So that's my condition. Just if nothing is here, then you cannot press it. And so then if I type something there and then just switch to the other thing, it will automatically enable this button because this is populated. This is kind of a silly example. You would probably use it to something like, uh, if I don't have a selected Pokemon, then don't uh, allow me to press this button. Or if I don't have a path, you cannot save the file. Or if the file is empty, you cannot save it. It's probably not what you want to do. But something like that, something that depends on something else and you want to easily connect them together by just providing the predicate. Okay, I probably don't have demo for converters. But con what converters do is what I've shown you in the visibility. So normally you would create a converter that would say, okay, on the VPF there is this visibility that can be hidden and visible, but on my view model there is uh, this is visible property that is a Boolean. And I, you need to convert in between those two, and that you can do by converter. You say, I have a converter that can take Boolean and produce this visibility enum. And so when it binds, you get true here, you convert it to visible, you get false here, you convert it to hidden. So you adapt kind of the view model to fit better within your view, but you don't have to deal with the view specific types inside of your view model because you're using the converter to convert them. So your view model would be simple, it will only have Boolean and your view would be able to do its job. All right, I think, oh yeah, this is also my original demo. If it starts, if it doesn't reset my ISC again. Maybe it doesn't start at all. Oh yeah, okay. There we go. So this is a thing that I was research researching it on. And pretty much what I'm doing here is that I wanted to have reactive UI where I can press this and add the stars to the top. But at the same time, I can run this background task, which is like doing sleep on the background for like 300 milliseconds and then writing to the progress bar. But at the same time, I still want to be able to update the stars and so on. Because if all of this was done on the same thread, you would never get the updates. And if the binding didn't work, you would never get the updates and so on. So this was my proof of concept application, if you want to dig into it. OK. Um, five more minutes, great. So I will go and dig to the insights of the actual implementation here. Because for me, that's the interesting part, not how it works. <laughs> um, OK, so I have two parts. One part is the one that uh, implements the base class 
and does the nice uh, methods that you have and implements the specialized relay command and so on. But in the end, in the C-sharp, it's just two classes, very simple classes, that uh, have some static properties that enable you to, or enable me, to provide the outside, of, outside work in the form of script block and then invoke it from this class. So all the background work, all the like creating of the background command can be written in PowerShell instead of writing it in C-sharp. And so I pass an invoke command in its script that uh, adds the property to the object, uh, the one that creates the background work, then I implement the event, and implement uh, the method that will be called on property changed. And then I define this one, which you saw, where I provide one script block that does the background work, one script block that does the callback, and then the can execute um, can execute the predicate as well. And from that, uh, let me just scroll down. Okay, here's the init. It just calls back to a different script block. And from that, what happens when I'm creating the command? I will create this new relay command, which is the second class in this in this project. And I give it this background work script and I invoke it with this background work. That's the thing that you provided. And I also have this callback, which was just a simple way of doing a lot of UI work at the end of the task. Because this one will run in the, in the background run, uh, run space, but this one will run like through a dispatcher in the UI. So you don't have to specify the dispatcher, but that was at the start where I didn't have the dispatcher helper method. So now just this would be enough and just specifying a big dispatcher at the end. And then the can execute is passed. And what's, uh, what's a bit special about this is that I'm passing in the this reference um, to the inside of this new class. So I'm creating... Um, new class that grabs the reference to the previous class so it can pass it on to the actual work. So this, this instance will refer to the PowerShell class that we created because we are inheriting from the view model base. And so we need to pass it on so this relay command is created with it. And if I go inside, Then I call it self in the inside because I cannot redefine this. And so the, I have just a prop or a field on this object where I put this reference. Uh, what you have to do to execute, so this would be the script block and then the predicate that enables you to execute. And then when you press the button, it will actually execute the script. So it calls execute on it or it takes the execute script block and invokes it and passes in uh, the reference to the previous object. So this way everything is bound together. And even though you have one extra class, you have a method that generates this class, you are still able to very easily refer back to the dollar this reference and just write the properties on it. So the syntax is nicer. And then all the internal points that actually do the real work are defined here here in the BPF. And so here I have the view model base, and as I said, I have some static properties on it so I can share the stuff between really easily. So this is what you do when you call the init method. You just give it the self, you give it the property name, and it will add member, which will simulate the set and get. As I said, there are probably better ways to do it, but this was the first one that I could come up with and that worked pretty easily. Then you have the background work script and that's pretty involved. Uh, so you wouldn't want to write it yourself every time you want to do background work. You want the framework to do it for you. So you just give it the work, you give it the callback. And then the dollar underscore root that I had, it's pretty difficult to get the root inside, like the location of the script inside of the, of the background work. So I grab it here and I try to pass it on somehow, but in the actual work, I'm just defining a variable that I'm picking up later. So here I have a script block that takes this, 
creates this log function, which is another utility function that just writes logs from the background uh, run space to this file. So then you can do like get content and wait and look at the file so you see what you are doing in the background because it will log all the errors and all the stuff that's happening in the background. And you can also use it in your own script log. So if in your own script log you say log and you provide some mes message, it will write it to this log so you get visibility of what's happening in the background without being able to write it to the actual console. Then I have the sing hash, which is coming from the work that Boy does. And it just creates a hash table. You insert all of the data that you want to sync in between the run spaces and uh, the work as well. You create the run space, uh, grab the data from the sync hash, redefine the log function again because you are in another run space again, invoke the main work, and also define the functions inside of the script log that's, that's provided. So everything seems seamless but it's a lot of, lot of weird work on the background. And you also need closures to be able to do this and so on. So if you want to have fun afternoon, take this code and dig into it and try to break it and then fix it again. But pretty much the logging makes a lot of stuff much easier because you can see the errors that are happening, the errors that your code is throwing, so you get info about what happened. And then it's just invoked. And that's the whole framework. Two classes and few script logs that just enable the stuff that's missing that prevents you from doing the actual binding and actual calling of the commands. OK, if um, this is up, to, up for adoption, because I probably won't have time to go forward with it, and I don't really have the need. I just wanted to see if it's possible and if I can get it work in a like, pretty nice way. So if you would be picking this up, there are a few approaches that didn't work. You can take all the C-sharp code and you can write it in PowerShell, including the events, but it gets stuck for some reason. So probably because how uh, the events work in PowerShell, but I'm not really clear on that. You can, uh, take, you can take PS object, which would be really convenient because we wouldn't, want, wouldn't need the classes, but you cannot add events to it. At least, no, I don't know how. Um, what I also tried is that I have this uh, C-sharp class that I call notifiable, which is empty and just implements the I notify property change. And then I have a function that takes a PS object and copies all the properties from the PS object onto the instance of the notifiable so I can raise events. But this doesn't work because, as Steve uh, pointed out, you need to implement this I dyn dynamic meta object provider which uh, is what enables the dynamic keyword in c -sharp to work, and it also enables the binding to pick it up and just link to the PS custom object. So probably if you would implement this on the notifiable, then this approach would work and would be super convenient. Um, we can talk about that if you want to pick this up. Then one thing that to be aware of, uh, taking the script block from the one side through the sync hash and then just invoking it directly in the background will get your UI stuck again. So you need to take it and uh, recreate it like through the script block create, converting the original script block to script uh, to string and create a new script block so it gets unbound and runs in the background run space. And this also brings problems like with getting functions from the main uh, run space to the background run space. That's why I had this dollar underscore and had to dot source again the, the tasks PS1. But those are problems that can be solved somehow. Probably I just didn't have time to do it uh, till the demo. Possible improvements that I could see is that we automatically init all the properties or they are rewritten to work natively, more natively to PowerShell. Uh, we can also do like init with dependent properties. Like I said, in C Sharp, you can do like notify property change on this and also on something else. So we could have easy syntax that would uh, not take just list of a uh, single property, but multiple names of properties and notify all of them. Uh, there's also this binding debugging, which is super helpful when you are 
when you are trying to debug where your code is not, where your view is not correctly connected to the view model. So if you use this, it will give you a lot of info and especially errors that will tell you, I was trying to bind to name, but there is no name on the object. So you get visibility of that in your console as well. And if you change this level, you will get way more info than you want. Um, yeah, converters, I didn't really have that much time to research uh, on them because you have to create a custom class for it and inherit, and it's just difficult to implement. So probably you want to take some approach like I do with the relay command. So it implements it for you on the background, and then you just plug it in with a script block that actually does the conversion. Uh, you can make it into full framework using like VPF extras, which is a library that has a built-in progress where you can just say, okay, this and that, and it will have this description and it just pops up and does an overlay over the whole screen. Or you probably know Mach apps, like this nice colorful theme for VPF. So that would also be awesome. <laughs> and uh, you can also add something like invoke action with uh, progress and uh, that would enable you to automatically report to something that's already built in. So you get the same experience like in PowerShell, where you say write progress and you get the progress bar and then the message. So you could very easily do that as well and build it into the framework. If you want to adopt this, then it's up for grabs. I won't probably be developing it anymore, but I'm available for discussions. So if you want to take it, run with it, and do something interesting with it, you're more than welcome to contact me. So the summary would be that MVVM is possible in PowerShell and makes uh, creating reactive UIs reasonably simple. You can choose between the traditional and new style. So the traditional uh, style would be when you just want to show the data in, in a more nice manner. And the new style would be useful when you want to write like more interactive application where you actually click and get the data from somewhere, and you have some interaction with the app, it has some state, and it does some work that depends on the internal state. I just shown the absolute minimum to get the point about VPF across. It can do way more than that. It can do styles uh, and so much more. So um, now you can learn it the way it was meant to be. I also have still pester stickers, even though it's unrelated, so come and grab. Uh, the slides and demo will be on the PSCon view. I also will publish this toolkit on my repo. It's there. I just need to make the repository public. So that's it for me. If you have any question, I hope you ask. Five minutes for questions. Okay, I saw the hand raised there even before. And you're next. Please. Um, I hope it will work with. The question was if it works with PowerShell 6 or 7, right? So in PowerShell 6, it probably doesn't work because that's PowerShell core and there is no VPF. And I see Steve nodding, so it's totally true. And uh, with PowerShell 7, it should be based on .NET Core 3. And so there, and Steve again not, so it's confirmed, there should be a VPF built in there, and so it should work again. So it should be like PowerShell 5 and then 7 when that's released or available. Uh, probably just Windows, because VPF will, should be available only on Windows. I haven't seen any plans on porting it to the other, other platforms. But Maybe with this, maybe there are other approaches that we can use to write better UI. Maybe just use it as, uh, as a solution to integrate it better with web technologies that are rendered in this. I'm not really that much into PowerShell and UI, but this always bugged me, so I wanted to research it. <laughs> um, you had a question, right? Uh -huh. The question is if I try to use PowerShell jobs for the async part and instead of run space. And I didn't because uh, PowerShell jobs by default run as a separate process. So what I would need to do is that I run the background work in pretty heavy process. And then in the end, I can grab the data from it and sync it. So uh, 
because I don't want to run any work on the main thread if I don't have to. I would still have to have something that runs on the background, monitors the job, and pumps the data out, and then puts it in the UI. So I would need a run space for that. So that's why I only have like main thread and run spaces in the background. Plus, they can also communicate directly through dispatcher, because they have it as a reference. And that's what dispatcher is for, to communicate the background work towards the UI. So you, you can try it, but I don't see much point to it. And also in PowerShell 7, I heard there should be like lightweight threads, or maybe it's in, in the preview, I don't know. Uh, lightweight jobs that run as threads. So that would also be super useful if there was a good integration with that, because then it would be even easier and even more lightweight. Other questions, please? OK. Uh, code generators. If there are any code generators for the XAML. I mean that you can have like, uh, uh, that you have a tool to uh, graphically design the mm -hmm. and generate the XAML. Yes, yeah, so if there is a tool where you can create graphically the UI and generate the XAML from it. So the best tool to do that is Visual Studio. Visual Studio Community is free, you can use it. And uh, there are no other tools that I know that would do this. Maybe some open source tools that I saw in the past. But I usually just write it from my mind. Or I use full Visual Studio to design the UI 